Amen. Listen, why don't you look around and let somebody know that I love you and there's nothing you can do about it but love me back. And as I always tell you, Cashmere, a better me makes a better us. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continuous be in my mouth. My soul shall burst in the Lord. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Everybody in the building, every breathing soul, everybody that has breath in the lungs, everybody that's not hooked up to a respiratory system, everybody that's not in ICU unit, Everybody that's on the scene, everybody that's on the screen, everybody that's in sitting in the living room, everybody that's sitting laying in the bed, everybody that's, that made it through yesterday ought to give God some praise. You can praise him through your mask. You can praise him uh, until the devil try to block you. The mask can't block you. The devil can't block you. Is there anybody in here feel like praising the Lord? Well, tell your neighbor, I wouldn't sit down on a God who woke me up this morning. I wouldn't sit down on a God who watched over me all night long. If you're in the house to praise him, stand on your feet and praise his holy and righteous name. Amen. Come on, clap your hands again all over the building and let's give him a praise. Hallelujah. Come on, let's get some congregation to help on this morning. Amen. How many of you know praise and worship is a corporate praise? So we're going to praise him together. Amen. Oh, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Why don't you bless that wonderful name of Jesus? Yeah, yeah, no other name. Come on, let me see you clap your hands. Come on and bless that wonderful name of Jesus. You ought to bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Why don't you bless that wonderful name of Yeah, yeah, no other name. Well, there's power in the name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. You are to bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other name. I'd... Come on and put your hands together. Come on, let me see you clap if you love him. Come on now, the Bible says we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. So come on, let's give him a praise. Well, there's power in the name of Jesus. I know there's power in the name of Jesus. Oh, power in the name of Jesus. No other name. Oh, you ought to bless that name. Bless that name. Bless that name, bless that name, bless that name. You ought to bless that name. Power in the name of Jesus. 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 Power in the name of
bless that name. Come on and bless that name. Come on and bless his name. You ought to bless his name. Power in the name. Love in the name. Peace in the name. Come on and bless that name. Yeah, bless that name. Yeah, bless that name. Come on and bless his name. Come on and bless his name. Come on, put your hands together for Jesus. Oh, bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. Bless that wonderful name of Jesus. No other name I know. Come on, you ought to bless his name if you love him. Come on, bless his name if you need him. Come on, bless his name. Hallelujah. We are living in a day where our government will pay us not to work. You can have all the faith you want to, but if you don't have some work, go along with your little faith. You won't be able to stand up against the test. The devil, listen, don't miss this. The devil uh, don't care how much you believe as long as you believe and still sitting down. But when you start working, your act in your faith, hell get nervous. Demons get upset. Witches start trembling. Hex get broken. Curses get destroyed. Go on, tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, I'm about to work this thing. I'm about to work it. What I got left, I can't use what I used to do. I can't go where I used to go. But I'm going to work with what I got left. Is there anybody in here feel like working for the Lord? See, yeah. See, yeah. Yeah, I feel like working for the Lord. He's been good. He's been good. In our morning scripture reading, we find the people of God working with what they had left. I know you burned the candles on both ends, but God can use what's left. Good God Almighty. In Nehemiah, the second chapter, our pastor already taught us this. Nehemiah, the second chapter, I'm reading out the easy to read version. Verse 17 and 18. Then I said to them, you see, you can see the trouble we have here. Jerusalem is a pile of ruins and is at the gates has been burned with fire. Come, let's rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then we will not be shamed anymore. I also told them that my God has been kind to me. I told them what the king said to me. Then they answered, let's start to work now. So they began his great work. This is the word of the Lord that may comfort the people of God. Ain't the Lord all right? Let us pray. 
God our Father, we thank you. We thank you for this day that you allow us to see. God, we give your name the glory because all we want is for you to get the glory. We want our lives to shine so others may see you in us. God, thank you for this worship moment. But we need to hear a word from you now. So speak into this place until we are never the same. Speak into this place until hell get nervous. Speak into this place until demons start trembling. Speak into this place until chains start breaking. Speak into this place till giants start falling. Speak into this place until broken relationships are put back together again. We not gonna wait until it's over to bless you, God, but we gonna praise you right now while we still in the fight. We gonna praise you while we still going through it. We gonna give you the praise right now because you already working it out for our own good. Now, God, we pray that you interrupt our regular service program this morning and give and praise you anyhow. We just didn't come for ourselves, but bless our neighbor that's on our right, our neighbor that's on our left. If they need healing, heal them. If they need forgiving, forgive them. Bless our preacher that's going to come. Let him down in the deep treasure of your holy and righteous will. Forgive us for our sins and give us another chance. So we can show you how much we love you. We pray this in no other name that matters. But in Jesus name. The one who can still turn water into wine. The one who can still walk on water. The one who can forgive us for all our sin. And give us another chance. And we want to say thank you master. It's in your name we pray. That all the children of God say amen. Amen. Come on, clap your hands again for the Lord on this morning. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on, let's clap for God. Amen. How many are grateful that he woke you up this morning? How many are just glad he started you on your way? Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be in the service. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, clap your hands again all over the building. Oh, the Lord is high above the heaven. The Lord is high above the heaven. And his glory above the nation. And his glory above the nation. The Lord is high above the heaven. The Lord is high above and his glory above the nation. Oh, give God the highest praise and not let him always. And all God's people say, Hale, Hale, Hallelujah. Hale, Hale, Hallelujah. Hale, Hale, Hallelujah. Hale, Hale, Hallelujah. Hey, the Lord is high above the heaven. And the glory above the nation. The Lord is high above the heaven. And the glory above the nation. Oh, give God the highest praise that God made Him always. And all God's people say, Hale, Hale, Hallelujah. Hale, Hale, Hallelujah. Hale, Hale, Hallelujah. Hale, hale, hallelujah. Hey, the Lord is high above the heaven. Come on, let me see you put your hands together all over the building. And the glory above the nation. Hey, the Lord is high above the heaven. And the glory above the nation. The Lord is high above the heaven And His glory above the nation 
Oh, give God the highest praise, acknowledging Him always and all God's people say, Halle, halle, hallelujah. Halle, halle, hallelujah. Halle, halle, hallelujah. Halle, halle, hallelujah. Oh, if you really love the Lord, shout it.
Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Wonderful Savior. Wonderful Savior. Hallelujah. We love him on this morning. We love him on this morning. Hallelujah. How many are grateful that you're safe in the arms of Jesus? I don't know about you, but despite this pandemic and everything that's going on, I'm grateful to be safe in his arms. How many are really glad to be safe in his arms? Hallelujah. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. He lets me rest in the meadows grass, and he leads me beside that quiet stream. He restores my family. Helps me to do what honors him the most. That's why I'm saved. Any witness in the house, I feel so saved. That's why I'm saved. Safe in his arms. Hallelujah. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. He lets me rest in the meadow's grass, and he leads me beside that quiet stream. He restores my family. What honors him the most That's why I'm safe How many of you feel safe That's why I'm safe Safe in his arms And we Oh, I'm saved, 
I have one or two people who done been through some stuff. Look like I got one or two people in here who came up in this place to tell the Lord thank you. Look like I have one or two people in this place done been through hell and high water and God has brought you out. Look like I have one or two people in here that struggled this week, but press their way on anyway. And in the house of the Lord, as David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's just good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Two years stuck behind your own home couldn't go here, couldn't go there. And I just thought that as soon as God allowed us to break free, that people would run to the house of the Lord. Spared you through the pandemic. Didn't even know sometime how you would go pay your bills if your job was going to let you go. And God preserved you. And then when the first time we got some freedom, we was ready to get on Spirit Airlines and try to go where we've never been before. So soon as we got free, we was ready to go back to the clubs and have us a little hookah and do all the things that we were doing before we got to where we were. Didn't even think, let me just stop by the house of the Lord to tell him thank. I'm glad that I'm bringing this up because it's apropos, it's regarding what I'm preaching today. Well, that's a lot of foolishness going on in this world, isn't it? It seems like it's foolishness on every hand. It's government foolishness. It's academic foolishness. It's church foolishness. It's marriage foolishness. It's adolescent foolishness. At least adolescent foolishness is explained in the word. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far away from them. But the good news is, in spite of foolishness, we have a faith. We have a God that sits above all, knows all, sees all, and has all power. That's why we've come here today because we recognize where all our help come from. Grateful for this spirited beginning of worship service through scripture, prayer, and song to get our hearts and minds ready to receive a word from the Lord. Listen, let us go to Nehemiah. Nehemiah 10, starting at verse 28. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version of Scripture and it says the rest of the people the priest the Levites the gatekeepers the singers the temple servants and all who have separated themselves from the people of the lands to the law of God their wives their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding. Join with their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his rules and statutes. Verse 39 says, For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain and wine and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. 
need you to look at your neighbor and repeat these words. We have work to do. Look at your other neighbor and say, we have work to do. You may be seated. We have work to do. On last week, we adventured to look at Jesus after the resurrection. And upon meeting his disciples at the appointed place and the appointed time, he let them know when he came that each and every one of them would have to do what is called the Great Commission. However, upon getting there, the Bible records some doubted and some had the hardness of their heart. But in spite of their present condition, it did not stop Jesus from still giving them their marching orders, letting them know that there is an expectation as it relates to their faith in God and the witnessing of the miracle of the resurrection from the dead of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What I love about Jesus is that he did not leave them to their own devices or alone. For we will find out in the book of Acts that the day of Pentecost would come and he would send another, a comforter, a teacher, the Holy Spirit. And it would be that Holy Spirit that would give the people the understanding of the word and the revelation of God in their own language that every man, woman, girl, and boy could hear and understand and make a decision for themselves. Let us know that each of us have an individual responsibility for carrying out the gospel, not merely in what we say and what we know by head knowledge, but truly in what we've understood relative to what has been revealed by the Spirit of God that each of us may be able to live out that which we've been preordained and predestined according to his divine purpose of our lives that we might conform to his son Jesus Christ and therefore be the emblematic of his light and of his love expressly as one that God himself has plucked out of the muck and mire of life and placed on a solid rock. It is understanding that this individual commitment is not overshadowed by the commitment we must make collectively. As we assemble together making praises, prayers and supplications to our God with all humility and fear knowing that God is a holy God who sits high and he looks low. Recognizing that God is nothing to trifle with He's nothing to be played with. He's not some casual friend that you can just bump fists with, pass by, as if he's not the creator of everything. He's one that should be reverenced. He's one that should be acknowledged, and he should be prioritized as first in our lives. In this book of Nehemiah, we discovered that they were at a point they were taken into captivity, not because God did not love them, but they decided that they did not want to follow that which God had commanded. And God allowed their enemies to take over, to take them into bondage, to enslave them, not only them, but their children. They were watching their generations be born in slavery and under the oppressive hand of that which worshiped idols and being given over to perverse thoughts and to those things that would eventually end up in destruction, chaos, and calamity. Yet God being merciful, because he had established covenant with a people, he then releases them from their bondage and brings them back to the place called Jerusalem, that meaning the place of peace. He brings them back to Jerusalem so that they can continue on being his people and they could continue knowing that he is their God. 
What I like about it is God starts off this unifying project by sending a man who was in a position by which he was enjoying the creature comforts of life. He was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah ate the king's food before the king ate the king's food. He enjoyed the pleasures of the king without being the king. And it reminds me of what I enjoy as a co heir with Christ, that though I'm not him, he has allowed me to be a partaker in every blessing, every strength, everything that I need, that I too might be one that is a child of God. That he is the first of the resurrection from the dead that I too might be resurrected from the dead. This is my hope in the gospel that one day I lay down my sword and shield that this body will return to the dust from whence it came. But there is a part of me, a soul that I've decided to follow Jesus. And because of it, I lay hold of the blessed assurance that Jesus himself will do for me what I cannot do. For myself, Nehemiah was given the unction and he was tugged that heart to go and help his people who were living a life of dilapidation. The walls and the gates were burned and torn down. He, he then inquires of the king after much prayer to God that if he needed some time off, from his lush plus job of eating kingly food and staying in the best of places, sleeping on the best of mattresses and enjoying what the king's uh, palace had to offer that he might go and put his hands in the dirt and help his people resurrect that which was seemingly dead. The king, because of God, gave him favor and granted him everything he needed in order to get the job done. Nehemiah shows up and with opposition in the way, he still overcomes the opposition and the obstacles by being diligent, steadfast, and the people agreed and came together as one. Listen, everybody didn't come along for the ride. There's always some people when you're doing the work that's going to stand on the sidelines and not want to get their hands dirty, but let me help you. Don't waste your time worrying about who not doing something, but go ahead and work with who Whoever is going to help you do something. So you used to wasting your time and your breath on people who don't want to do. You, you have to be about your father's business because when you stand before God, he's going to judge you according to your words. For every deed, every word, every thought is going to be judged by him. For our God is a consuming fire. Nehemiah. After Zerubbabel had come back with a remnant, after Ezra had come back with a remnant, these walls were still not built. Over a hundred years of saying the walls need to be built, God divinely sends Nehemiah, and in 52 days, in spite of turmoil and trouble and temptation and opposition and being diligent, the wall was completed. Some people would have thought it's time to pack up. We did what we were supposed to do. But that was just step one regarding the reform of the people and the bringing it back together. It was more than about brick and mortar. It was a lesson in learning how to be diligent with your hands and doing your part. And when you do your part and somebody else does their part and somebody else does their part and the mortar that binds us is love and commitment and obedience to God we can fortify ourselves against the hand of the enemy because we believe that God is our very present help that he is with us in all things and if I just do my part God himself will ensure everything else is taken care of and the people realize that this thing bigger than walls they called the priest Ezra and they say now you need to come and you need to break out the word of God. We need to hear a word from the Lord. They construct a pulpit. They 
build a place for the word of God to be recited from. And Ezra begins to read from the word of God and the people were so convicted and pierced at their soul, they began to mourn and cry and weep realizing how far they had went away from the mark of holiness and how they had truly turned their back on the God who had preserved their fathers and their grandfathers and their great grandfathers who had kept them through the wilderness experience had blessed them in a place that was dry and gave them water out of a rock who had provided for them manna from heaven and even when they complained gave them quail he did for them in the wilderness to let us know that God himself can provide for us in places and in situations that no one else could ever provide. I know I got one or two people that's been in the wilderness in your life. You didn't have no job. You didn't have a place to stay. Didn't know how you go feed your children. But every day God woke you up and he gave you strength and he put one foot in front of the other and you kept on going. You kept on climbing. The road got rough sometime. The mountain got rocky sometime. But you kept on going and God revealed to you that in your weakness his strength is made Lord have mercy I'm happy in this place already made perfect then he says no 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 don't y'all weep this is the time to rejoice because once you realize that God didn't treat you as your sins deserve and he still kept a remnant and he still brought you together and you still got a work completed God was letting them know it don't take a whole lot of folk it just take committed folk to get the job done God will do it if we believe that he will and they began social reform, religious reform, domestic reform. They start looking to the word of God to figure out what they need to do. What I realized is they got to the point according to chapter 9, at the end of chapter 9, they realized that our sin was the issue and that's the reason we were in great distress. Let me help somebody in here. A lot of things we go through is not because the devil is trying to take you out. He, he's doing that because that's his job. But a lot of time, we are the devil's number one assistant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We commit spiritual suicide daily because we choose the flesh over the spirit. The Bible tells us that the flesh and the spirit are at constant war with one another. The soul, the seat of your emotions, your mind has to make a decision Well, what you're going to do. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. Every day you wake up, you have to make a choice about how you go conduct your business, how you go conduct yourself, how you're going to let life affect your thinking and the decisions will ultimately determine the end therein. This, this is not a temporary fix. This is not a Sunday morning recipe. This, this is a daily walk with God and it's a struggle and it hurts sometimes and you get tired sometimes and you want to give up sometimes but I'm so glad that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yeah, no, nah, y'all ain't gonna do me like that. Y'all sit down. Don't do me like that. Nah, I ain't on no wrong. Get on, sit down, because y'all about to make me go. I ain't trying to go right now. I'm gonna get about this thing quickly, because I know we're ready to go. Says that they publicly agreed to follow the laws. Now, I didn't read all of those names. It would have been impressive, though. But there's a list of names. These are some people that say, go ahead and sign my name. You know, we get proud of those that signed the Declaration of Independence. These people say, listen, we so serious about committing ourselves to God, we're going to put it on paper. We're going to not only understand there's a covenant, we're ready to make a contract. Yeah, yeah, that's what makes marriage so important. It's not just a covenant, it's a contract. 
Or if you don't believe it's a contract, then, then to go to divorce court and see. Nobody's talking about give me my five years of love, I got it. They don't care nothing about love. No, no. They want to know about property and money. It's a contract. Where these kids go, go. How long we going to do this? What this about? Because we are severing a covenant, but it was under contractual obligation. Look, look at what happens. He begins to outline how we have to go to work. It's not just working like at the church. We do need you working in the church. That, that's true. But, but it all starts at the house. Verse 30, he's going to talk about the domestic issues. In 31, he's going to talk about the business or the commercial issues. In the next one, he's, in verse 31, he also talks about the agricultural issue. He's going to talk about the social issues in verse 31. He's going to talk about the religious issue in verses 32 through 37. He's going to talk about the economic issue in verse 38. These are all issues that impact us today. And when you're talking about going to work, it's more than going to a job and earning wage. It's about how you steward that which God gives you and is it bringing him some glory. Everything you work for is all about what people can see you have and what you're doing. Then the truth is, you're living in arrogance. You're, you're living unto yourself, and it's unprofitable for what would it gain? What would it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? And then Nehemiah ends in verse 39 and says, The final obligation is not to neglect the house of God. That's three things I'm going to hit you with and then I'm getting about your way. First of all, when we see them making this commitment, the first thing is it was a personal commitment. We see these names of these leaders and as they sign it, the Bible says that the rest of the people who identified themselves with their leaders also was in agreement with what exactly was going on. That that's why these men are important in this church. Because these men are leaders of households and if we're going to be any kind of church, if we're going to be any kind of society and any kind of people, men are going to have to take the role of leader and be upstanding and upright and live according to the word as Christ being their head so that they can lead families in ways that God will be pleased. Women and had to shoulder and carry the burden of the family, of financial obligation, spiritual obligation. They paying and they praying. I'm going to say it again. The women are paying and they praying. And all we doing is staying. Truth is, if you're going to have a man, he's going to have to learn as these men did. I'm going to have to make a decision personally that I know is going to affect my whole family. Not just this generation, but the generations to come. Oh, oh, I know generations are affected because when we grow up, we talk about big mama prayers and grandmama and grandfather prayers because they invested in us by praying for us being sacrificial in all that they did that we can enjoy these creature comforts we readily enjoy and take advantage of and now we're in the position to help someone else but we're so concerned with the limelight and it being about us and our individual brand and what we are when the truth is if God takes his breath from you you are nothing but a hunk of flesh that is now going back to the dust from whence it came. Let me help you in here. That, that, there's nothing in the grave. There's no prayer in the grave. Your will won't be done in the grave. People trying to run the earthly business from the grave. When you die, it's over on this side. And whatever's left on this side, you won't no longer have stewardship, control over. That's why it's important to get your house in order while you can. Let, let me get out of here. Uh, this personal commitment is not just because of the men. It says their wives. It says their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding. I watched this little girl right here. This little girl right here, 
when she would, listen, y'all ain't seen no praise going on. This little girl over here had that one hand and was just going in. She, I, she didn't care nothing about y'all. She didn't care nothing about me. That music was hitting us so good, she was feeling, she was in it, just going at it. And just think, when she really understands who God really is, but sometimes God will use a child, he'll use a babe to demonstrate what we ought to look like. We, we ought to be able to praise God without any uh, kind of restriction. We are not worried about what somebody else is thinking. Matter of fact, I'm so focused on God, I don't even know you in the building. It. No offense, my brothers and my sister, but God has been too good to me. I realized without him, I would be dead, sleeping in my grave. My soul would be degenerate. I would be confused and lost. One most miserable erection undone. But because of his grace and his mercy and his love towards us, God himself blesses us with new mercies every day. First of all, if we're going to have work to do, we got to make a personal commitment. The next thing we have to have is a public commitment. Yeah, it, these old secret Christians. Some people just Christians on Sunday in their church. Go to work on Monday, they don't even know you're a Christian. Around your own family, they don't even really know you're a Christian. But when you come to church, you know how to put on your mask and become a Christian. You know how to come in and be religious. You, you know what to say. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. You've learned the, the back and forth of religion. But the truth is, if you are not serving others, if you have not been humble before God, your religion is in vain. There has to be a public commitment. It was affirmed and recorded among most witnesses, and many of these witnesses, that people who had paid, who, the people who had prayed publicly, had also made their promises publicly as well. Though it was in though it was personal, it wasn't individualistic, as if it was just a matter of concern for the individual. Issues affected the whole congregation, the whole assembly in general, and everyone openly testified to their friends and neighbors that they were presenting themselves afresh to God. Commitment of that kind is important, and it is needed to have an effective Christian testimony. For us, it is baptism, and it is the communion that we enjoy as ordinances of the church. This is a form of public declaration that we believe and we have signed our allegiance and loyalty to Jesus Christ, our Lord. We have to be willing to have a public commitment. Then we also gotta have a practical commitment. These people that just have general uh, statements about their faith, they, they were specific and what they were going to do. When I looked down, they said, we're, we're, we're going to make sure domestically we handle this thing right. They said, we're not going to give our daughters over to the priests of their, to the peoples of their land or take their daughters for our sons. They said, we're not going to be doing the mixed marriage thing. Now, now, now watch this. Some people are going to think I'm talking about race because that's how we are. No, no, we're talking about faith. To be equally yoked to have the same faith belief. When you're going through trouble, we need to be able to call on the same God at the same time. One can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. That means that when we come together exponentially, something starts to happen. That's the power of marriage. Let me help you in here. Marriage, no matter what they say in this country, what I deem as a civil union, which is authorized by the government, they can do that. But when you say marriage, it has been defined by God as the union or covenant between male and female husband and wife together. I'm gonna help somebody else. Male and female is a non-negotiable. At birth, without you saying a word, you can look at 
the baby and determine the gender of the child. God made it where you can look at us and say, if you possess this, you're a male. If you possess that, you're a female. And that is as cut and dry as you can get it. But we done got so smart, we done got so, so about our little minds that, that we are now deep trying to trivialize that which is simple and make it complex. And God says, no, you have to understand the original formula. It takes male and female together to procreate and make a... I don't care how strong a man is and I don't care what he think he got going on. You don't have a womb. You don't have ovaries and you don't have fallopian tubes. You still need a man and a woman to procreate. What, what he was saying was, we're not going to give our sons and daughters over to people who worship pagan and idol gods because that's how paganism keeps creeping in to what we're doing is because we're being influenced by other doctrines that is not the truth. That's why you got to be careful of what you let in your ear gate and your eye gate because that's what's going to fall out of your mouth gate. Trash in trash out the Holy Spirit like the garbage disposal when it come in it's not right he grind that stuff up and get it out of there but anything worth value he allows to stay grow and mature you so that you can become all he's created you to be they didn't just commit themselves domestically they also committed themselves practically commercially they say look we, 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 we not go keep disrespecting the Sabbath he said, we're we not going to, on the seventh day, sell. We're not going to buy something. We're we not going to transact on the seventh day. The day you said we should rest. We go rest like you told us to because you say, remember the seventh day and keep it holy. In other words, we're going to do what we're supposed to do. Let me tell you what happens to us. We start thinking that because we work in seven days a week that that's a blessing. But that's not really a blessing. That's a messing. God did not intend for you to work every day. He put it in his law. You need to recharge your body and your mind. The Bible says that, that the Sabbath was made for man. Man wasn't made for the Sabbath. God gave us the Sabbath so that we could recharge and refresh. Don't be proud because you work it seven days a week. That's why your body is rebelling. That's why your mind is strained up. That, that's why you go to doctors and your numbers are off. Because you're not doing properly and with what God has given us, what is necessary so that we can live according to him. If you think that little extra money is going to make a big difference and you're tired and you cannot enjoy it, then what was the purpose of even getting it? Says so we go, we gonna start taking care of the Sabbath and making sure we do the right. Then it says agriculturally. Says you told us to let the land rest seven years. He says we gonna go back to doing that because you told us to do it so that the ground would have a chance to replenish itself. You keep sucking the ground out of all of his nutrients and all. You you're not gonna have good crops. He told him you're working for six years and on the seventh year let it do what it do. If something grow up, you can get it. But if not, don't worry about it. We are so concerned with not having enough that we think that if we can't make it happen, it won't happen. Let me help you and let you know something. We are here today and it's not because you made it happen. You breathing is not because you made it happen. You living and it's not because you made it. It's in him that we live. It's in him that we move. It's in him that we have our being. Then they said we got some social practicality. Says we go forgive people debts. Oh, that's what it says. He said we will forgo the crops on the seventh year and exaction of every debt. He says after seven years, if you owe me something, it's zero. I know y'all thought that seven year rule was something that these people in the United States came up with. That's God's law. God said after seven years, if they didn't pay it, don't worry about it. 
Because one thing about God, God has a way of giving you what is fair, of taking care of you. And as a matter of fact, while you twisting, they on for five dollars, you owe somebody else fifty. It's quiet in here. You up there trying to take a splinter out their eye, you around here with a whole two by four hanging at your eye. Man, let me get out of here. Socially, if we will learn to be more loving and forgiving and understanding of the plight of one another. See, if you ain't never been broke before, you don't know how they feel. If you've never been hungry before, you don't really know how they feel. If you've never had a person be homeless, talk to me, brother, then you don't know how it feel. But if you've enjoyed the canopy of a roof with central air and heat, slept on the ceiling, posturepedic, always been able to get in a fine vehicle and go where you want, you don't understand the hurts, the pains, and the struggles of the poor, of the disenfranchised, of those with no hope and have been oppressed by those that keep their foot on their necks. But if you've ever found yourself in certain predicaments of life then you understand that there's a necessary grace that must be given and love shown that God himself might be glorified in your service to somebody else and he gets to the religious part before he even get to the church he did all that to get down to the religious part they begin to say we, we gonna start taking to ourselves our obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of the Lord. That's in verse 32. He says, they say, we obligated to give this. That, that's so that we can have the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offering, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, the sin offerings, and to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of God. They say, it is necessary that we give to the house of the Lord. Now, everything else I was preaching, y'all was crunk. I got to this point, and the amens got real few. It's okay, though, because when you go to the house of the Galleria, and whatever they tell you to pay, you drop it. When you go to the house of Randall Reed Ford, or if you go to the Mercedes dealer, whatever them people say, you willing to pay. When you go to the restaurant, you went and got that meal last week, it was $34. You go this week, it's $40, and you still go pay it. And the one place that we, because it's a voluntary obligation, is in the church, and this is the place we budget the most. But this is the place that we need the most. Where your money is, lets you know where your heart is. If your closet is outstanding, because that's your God in there. If your liquor cabinet looks better than any bar, that's your God. It's quiet in here right now. Look, look around and see where you're spending your money. That's going to tell you who your God is. And then if you look at how you have contributed to the ongoing of the house of God, comparing it to what you've done. If, if, if you more concerned with the house you live in and don't care about the house that God himself says I'll meet you at, he, he said to some people, he said, there you are in your sealed up houses and my house lay in waste. And then you got the nerve to say, I'm going to go to heaven and God where my man is. Say, listen, all of us have a responsibility. It got so deep, they say, listen, we're going to make sure we bring the first fruits of our ground, the first fruits of every fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. We're also going to bring to the house of our God, to the priests who minister in the house of the Lord, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle, as it is written in the law. Let me let you know, when them babies born, that first baby, you're supposed to bring that baby back to God. It sets a pattern because then you'll bring the rest of them. What you do with that first, go tell what you go do with the rest. That, that's why he says, if you bring the first fruits, 
He says, then your barns will be filled and your, your vats will be overfilled and overflowing with wine. You got to know when to give to God. You don't give to God after you've done everything. You give to God first and then do everything after that. Somebody look at me going, no, nah, I don't know. God ain't told me that. Don't worry about it. Because you're not even seeing the blessing that God really have in the obedience of your gift. You think God go owe anybody? Whatever you give to God, God knows how to give back. And he don't give it back exact. He go always put a little something on it. You don't believe me? Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me, test me, and see if I will not open up the window of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you don't have room enough to receive. He won't to know if you trust him first with what you have. When you wake up in the morning, the first person you ought to say hello to, not to your husband, not to your wife, the first thank you God for waking me up this morning. Let me talk to you first because when I put you first, everything else will line up after that. You wake up talking to that spouse if the night before wasn't a pleasant night, you done already started off on a bad foot. But if you wake up talking to him first, you're reminded that you are a child of God and there's a certain behavior and a certain way you ought to be living and it'll help you forgive him quicker. It'll help you love him more. It'll help you overcome self and be selfless instead of selfish. Man, let me get out of here. Lord, let me get out of here. Thank you. That's how you push me out the door. There you go. Help me. Push me out the door. He says that they will go collect the tithes. They were going to give to the house of the Lord because in order to really have economic success as a believer, you got to put your money where your mouth is. Boy, it's quiet in here. If you don't think enough of the Lord to shoot him $20 a week, Just shoot him a hot 20. I'm not even talking about tithing. You don't purpose nothing in your heart. When you come in here, you ought to already know, I got something for the Lord. Something to make sure that the house is taken care of, that the ministries can go on, that, that my pastor ain't having to get out here and, and, and say, oh, wait. It's quiet out here. Okay. There used to be a song that said, I hope I don't go back to slanging yayo. Slanging yayo to get my paper. Yeah, that's E40. Huh? Never mind. Not my fault. I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, you will put people in positions to have to do something outside of what they're supposed to do. This house is supposed to be taken care of by us. I'm going to say it again. This house, this expansive building, these grounds, this blessed place that have stood the test of time is now our stewardship. Now the question is, what are we going to do with it? Look, 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 look what happens. After they got through, they made a statement, and that's all I'm hinging everything on. We will not neglect the house of God. To neglect means to forget about. To act as if it don't matter. In a community that has been plagued by dilapidation and neglect, what a sad testimony that the place that's supposed to serve as a light on a hill, the place that's supposed to serve as a refuge from life storms, the place that's supposed to serve as a place of love and concern and consideration has been left unattended and unwanted by the very people that say they believe in the God that can do anything but fail. Well, what a sad uh, type of commentary is it to say that as people of God that we have not done what we should in obligation of giving to God that he himself might receive of us the benefit of our faith and thereby giving us that benefit back by prospering us in the way that we should go. We want God to to do everything for us but we don't want to do anything for him but the truth is when you think about God and consider all of his benefits you ought to realize that everything God has done has been the benefit 
us that God gave his son and he blessed us with his life that through faith we might receive eternal life and though I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity it is God himself that gave me the gift of life through Jesus Christ our Lord and that's why I have work to do because God has given me his spirit he's given me his word and he's given me faith to stand I wish I had one or two people who was inspired today to do some work for the Lord that when you look at the totality of your existence you can see that you have work to do whether it's at your home or whether it's in your business or whether it's socially whether it's economically whether it's in your faith you got some work to do and I don't care how cute you are I don't care how much money you have I don't care how many people know you and I don't care how many people you know if you have not turned your life over to the one who came down 42 generations hung on an old rugged cross gave up his life in exchange for ours that we might be called the blessed of God that you haven't even started living but I'm so glad that he gave me life and life more abundantly is there anybody in God's house that knows we got work to do that I'm tired of sitting on my laurels I'm tired of making excuses God didn't sit down on his laurels for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life I'm so glad that I'm the beneficiary of eternal life that's why whatever come my way whatever suffering I must do I'm gonna do it to the glory of God I'm like Paul when he says I will glory in my tribulations I will glory in my struggles because I know I got a God sits high and he looks low and he won't leave me nor will he forsake me but he will bind me up he will carry me on wiggles in and I'll fly away well where I'm gonna fly away I'm gonna fly away to a place of no more pain no more suffering no more tears no more doctors no more bill collectors no more lying no more gossiping no more trouble but every day every day every day it's gonna be sunday where i can look to him and say holy 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 is the righteous son of god i'm so glad that trouble don't last always that one of these days one of these days one of these days i'm gonna see him for myself i want to see my grandmother because i loved her so much i want to see my grandfathers because i love them so much but i really want to see the one who loved me so much that he died didn't he die he died didn't he die he died didn't he die but early but early but early sunday morning he got up with all power all power soul saving power holy ghost power set me on fire power heal my body power that i too that i too might be victorious and an overcomer in this world church somebody ought to tell the lord thank you somebody just right where you are personally just thank the lord let me help you get some thank you in you you know you should have been in jail for what you did go on tell him thank you you know you should have probably had aids for where you slept and who you slept with you ought to probably tell him thank you you shouldn't have your job for but God still gave it to you. You ought to tell the Lord thank you. 
Your family might be crazy, but they yours. You still ought to tell them thank you. You ought to thank them for 4302. For your praying ground, you ought to tell them thank you. If that didn't work, then I tell you what. If he woke you up this morning and it started you on your way, you ought to open up your mouth. The Bible declares, let everything, let everything, let everything that has breath, if you got breath, if you got breath, you ought to open up your mouth Look towards heaven and say yes. Say yes. Say yes. Yes. I know he's all right. We have work. We have work to do, church. And I pray something was said today that pricked you that kicked you, that hit you. My grandmother used to, every now and then, pop me upside my head. Say I'm knocking some, some, sen some sense into you. And every now and then, she was knocking the hell out of me. Y'all will get that one on the way home. It was twofold. She knocking some sense into me. But knocking some hell out of me, teaching me to be humble. And every now and then, God got to proverbially tap us. For the Bible says he chastises those that he loves. If you're going through a chastising moment, thank God that he sees you as a child. Amen. But also know God is merciful. and He's not going to destroy you, but in due season, he will restore you. He will strengthen you so that you can be all that he's called you to be. Somebody thank God in this house for his word on today. At this time, we offer Christ to you, my brothers and sisters. Those of you who are here, those of you who are watching online, listen, this is a serious time in the life of all of us because you never know you never know when your last day will be. We watch the news every day. Everybody nine, not old. Little 16 year old girl was at her house. In her, in her room in the dark. And this man, well this male, cause he's no man, gunned this young lady down in cold blood in a place that should have been safe. What I'm telling you is, time is full of swift transition. And you can think you got forever to do what you want on this side, but your body is letting you know you're getting older. Your, your body and your mind are letting you know that time is fleeting. And you can keep playing with this temporary state of existence as if it is to last forever. Or you can invest in your soul and give it over to God. He says, if you come to me seeking salvation, he says he'll give it to you. But you gotta come with your whole heart. You have to come with your whole mind. And God himself will sanctify you, justify you, and then he will glorify you. On today we offer you Christ. Let us bow. Heavenly Father, we come. And God, we just humbly submitting ourselves to your will on today. As someone amongst us, oh God, who are, they're struggling. They're struggling in their relationship with you, with others. They're struggling within themselves. They're depressed. They have anxiety. They're confused. And Lord, they just need some clarity right now. They came in here for clarity. They came in here for direction. Lord, you said that if we ask for wisdom, you, you would give it to us liberally. So, God, I pray that you would touch them. That you would create in them a clean heart and renew a right spirit within them. Pray even for us, O oh Heavenly Father, who have taken for granted this great salvation you've given us. We've grown lazy in our commitment and our work towards you and your kingdom. 
God, we ask for your forgiveness first of all, but then now we ask that you will strengthen us for the task at hand. Strengthen our hands, fortify our minds. Draw us closer together and then draw us closer to you. Lord, bless these under the sound of my voice as they diligently seek your way. Then God, we pray for our children right now. They're hurting. They're tempted on every angle. People are praying after them. They are looking to destroy their young lives and young bodies. They're manipulating their mind through media. God, on today, we pray divine protection for ours. Cover them. Then God strengthened them to be able to resist the devil. You said if we resist him, he'll flee. So God, give us the strength to resist that which tempts our flesh. But Lord, even when we fall, Lord, we pray on today that you will forgive us and that you will strengthen us. Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And then God, give us another chance. God, bless this place. Bless these people. Bless us that God we might be a blessing to others it is in no other name but Jesus we declare it is done and we all agreed by saying amen amen we thank God for each of you on today and now we are at the moment where we are getting ready to prepare for our communion but before we prepare I want you to get your mind ready to give an offering this is that time that you can show your appreciation and stewardship and listen we are no better than how we give we, we can only do what we're able to do and the only way we're able to do it is through our hands and our faith in God if we bring him something and we trust him with it God will open up doors of favor I wish I had somebody in here God has given you favor you didn't have necessarily the finance. You didn't even have the know-how. But God put people in your plate, in your way, that helped navigate you, and you've seen unusual favor in your life. You didn't even know you was going to have as much as you have. You didn't even know you were going to be able to do as much as you've done. But God keeps blessing you in spite of you. Today when you give, I pray that you give as though you're sowing a seed this is the garden so sow your seed in the garden because great things grow in the garden when you give thank God for what he has given you a seed and then with expectation you thank God for what you receive according to his will whatsoever a man sows that also will he reap sow in faith and you will also reap in faith lord bless these gifts that are getting ready to be given bless the hearts of the ones giving bless their hands and then god we pray eternal blessings on not just them but their perpetual generations that they too might be fruitful to every good work amen amen worship through giving luke 6 38 says give and it shall be given unto you a good measure pressed down shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap for with the measure you use it will be measured unto you text kgmbc to 77977 or kgmbc app to 77977 to give through our website, log on to www.cashmeregardensmbc.org. To pay through Zelle, the payee is kgmbcfinance at gmail.com. To pay through Cash App, cash tag Cashmere Gardens MBC. If you would like to send a love offering to our pastor, cash tag Pastor E-L-D. Our mailing address is 4302 Cavalcade Street, Houston, Texas, 77026. Stay connected. 
As we leave this place, but never his presence, let us do so in victory. Let us bow. Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us we have work to do. Now, God, let us be about your business. We must work while it is day, knowing that night is going to come when no man can work. God, bless these under the sound of my voice. Lord, I pray now that you let your spirit run afresh upon each and every one of them. Help us, oh God, discover our purpose, that God, we might do what we've been preordained and predestined to do, that you might be glorified. Lord, as we leave this place, but never your presence, we thank you, God, for going with us, standing by, strengthening us for every good work. We love you. We thank you. It is in no other name but Jesus. We declare it is done, and we all said amen. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it, but love me back. And what do we say here at Cashmere? A better me makes a better us. I love you. Go in peace. We thank you for worshiping with us here in the garden, here in the garden. Until we meet, until we meet again. Be praying. We'll for see you. you next Sunday.